Uh, this time I'm going to talk about our project, where we are, uh, what we're doing. Uh, you know me, you know what I do, so I'll skip that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the transition from the Open DJ project to Fortrack DS. So, um, it, it's something, so we've started uh, the Open DJ project in 2010 when Sun was acquired by Oracle. We forked uh, the Open DS project and started to um, do everything open source. And in uh, May 2016, our management decided to shut down the open source project. Um, it's a management decision. Fighting it would have been uh, a mistake because fighting it means I would have had to leave and run something else. Um, and I wouldn't care for myself, but I had built a team and the team was more important than, than myself. Um, the fact is it was a set of open source project and the only project that had external contributions was the open DJ one. And we had three contributions. One major one, the rest was like bug fixing or uh, RPM package. Um, over six years, more than 99% of the code commit was committed by our company. Um, and so the management decided that it was enough to <coughs> stop giving away all the value and not getting um, the return on investment in the open source community. Um, so the interesting thing is the last release that was fully tested was 3.0. And the open source project was stopped right in the middle of the next version. In a state, it's just cut at a specific day. We got an order, no, don't commit anything left in, in that repository. Um, which means the state of the open source is unknown. The, there are some known issues. There are features that are starting to be developed that are not being finished in that area. Uh, <coughs> so we continued um, on our own branch, and we released uh, after OpenDJ 3.5, and then we rebranded uh, to Forge Directory Services. Uh, we skipped the 4.0 release because we aligned all our versions to 5. So all our product, Forge product, went to 5. So we released um, four significant versions, and then a, a, a tons of uh, maintenance release from that. The, um, a lot of new features, one of the big one is a, a proxy feature. The interesting thing, I think, is it's very hard for someone who trying to work on an open source project when you're facing a big company uh, and a lot of work going on. So you're doing that on your spare time or as a side work. But we at Forge are dedicated to build it. We have a roadmap. We know where we want to go. We're trying to be open with that. But we have 21 person that are working in the team. 21 person as the product team that is not just developers. We have people that are developing training. We have people that are doing sustaining. They're part of engineering. Uh, we have uh, documentation, testers. So it's like 21 person. You're on, on your own trying to help with that project. It's very hard for you to understand what's going on because you have to deal with a lot of work. Um, so. There are three things I want to talk about today about a project. Um, the first one is a little bit outside of LDAP, but one of the biggest changes we've done uh, is we're starting to monitor, to provide a different interface for monitoring our server. Um, and um, so we've always had monitoring for LDAP. Over LDAP, we had it over GMX. We had an SNMP access, which had just a small part of, a, of the data. And um, we also put an HTTP layer that was just exposing the LDAP layer um, on top of it. Uh, but what we've done in, in uh, the recent versions, we moved to two standard uh, interfaces in the cloud. Um, so Prometheus and Graphite are two time series database that allows you to collect the data from multiple servers aggregate them in, in their database, and then use Grafana to visualize them. Um, and that has um, created a new interest for monitoring and also help us developers to actually solve some of the issues that we didn't see before. So the first benefit was for us. Our QA, our uh, test engineers, started to use that and monitor what was going on and then showed us there's a bottleneck here. 
it's not going, there's something wrong at this space in the process of replicating data. You can, so having metrics that expose uh, the queues, the, the, the time delay between replication kind of things help us a lot with getting uh, faster and more reliable. So um, a lot of customers are using that. I have customers that have actually built their own dashboards on top of it that shows the whole IAM stack. So not just directory, but also how access management using it, uh, what's the uh, implications of some access on the directory and back. So, so something you might want to look at. Um, now, another small thing we added, I think that's been in OpenLDAP for a while, but we've added the LDAP relax control rules. So that is a small extension that allows you when you send a modification, um, so the LDAP control, uh, re LDAP relax rules control is a small piece of information you add to your modification to say, relax some of the constraints you have on this operation. The typical one is when you want to modify attributes that are read-only, like the create timestamp or the modifier's name. And you most of the time need that when you're trying to synchronize data between different sources. So you have the same timestamp on both servers. So you know when it was last modified. Um, and so we implemented that for the, the, uh, the internet draft. Very easy, uh, simple thing. Now, I have customers that are asking for more. Things are not in the draft. And one of the things is password <coughs> policy state. So some of, some of the attributes like all the failure times, they want to synchronize failure times on the passwords from one server to the other. Um, and, and some of the things are supposed to be read-only and managed by the server. And I'm like, okay, am I going to stick with that internet draft or can I expand it? And the other thing is trying to allow administrator to, to manage things that are supposed to be managed by the server is also a dangerous thing. Because they may abuse it and then completely skew your security uh, for, for your system. So, um, do you, have you seen other use for that control outside that? You have? Password policy. That's what I said, password policy state. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have client side support for that when you go to LDAP. And uh, regarding the danger, I really display in the input form. If you modify it, anything that's enabled, I display danger, you know, so okay. in, in this, you, you know what, uh, what you are doing uh, when now submitting this input form. You know, so. so we are thinking about uh, doing something about this member of problem by uh, uh, having a, uh, a bad job correcting all of that and then it will be yeah. Yeah, I already have this in idea. Ah, okay. For a given reason. Okay, so use for member of, which is supposed to be read only, or could it be? Is that supposed to be a read only attribute for you in OpenLDAP? Okay. Okay. Well, it's not really read only. All right, so. Um, the, the third thing is about passwords and hash. So um, a lot of my customers are saying uh, they're using salty chat 512. Uh, we have the database is encrypted, so uh, if the disk is lost or if there's a, someone accessing the disk, getting access to the password is OK. It's encrypted. It's already hashed. The problem is insiders. If there's a, an administrator or someone that has access and then can read everybody's entry, they can read. They may be able to read the user password. They and, and probably the first one they will try to get access to is the CEO's one, not the or the admin's other password. And then they can once they copy one password, they can on the side try to brute force attack it. Um, and as people are moving things to the cloud, they're asking for stronger and stronger hash algorithm. So PBKDF2 is the one that is recommended by NIST. Um, Bitcrypt, Scrypt, all of them are based on the fact that they're expensive to run. 
So they compute a lot, they do a lot of computation, so they take a minimal amount of time. And at Bcrypt, I think we have a factor of 12, it takes about 100 milliseconds on a CPU, on a very recent CPU. Um, <coughs> the end result is that if you're using these mechanisms and you do a simple <laughs> bind, you end up with limiting the amount of binds you can do on your machine. Uh, we had a project, a POC, with uh, potential customers for 200 million users, uh, and they wanted to have Bcrypt as the as their password, and they wanted to do 10,000 binds per second at peak load. And we told them, if you want to do that, you need a thousand CPU. And that, of course, doesn't, doesn't work. Um, and the other thing is, if you really want to have a thousand CPU, you probably don't want to have them provisioned all the time, because this is peak work. So we started to think about, how about we doing hash as a service? So we delegate the hashing to another CPU outside, so we, d we don't provision everything. But then you have the, the problem of security when you, how you're sending a password in clear to get a hash, how do you trust that? It's, it's complicated. Um, so we're starting to look at Scram. So Scram is a standard that describes how to do uh, a password ha uh, authentication with a uh, strong uh, hashing algorithm. It's based on PVKDF2. Um, and, but it moves the computation of the hash mostly on the client side. So the, each client do their computation, then they do just one signature uh, and additional computation, send that to the server, and the server just does that additional thing, and then they compare. So a little bit of uh, calculate computation on the server side, a lot of computation on the client side, and that allows to scale much better. Um, so we, we've implemented that, and then we're starting to realize this is really nice, it works well. Scrum also has the advantage that if you, someone tried to do a simple bind, we can do all the computation on the server side. Uh, it's expensive, but it's not, not worse than the other ones. So we can do both simple bind and then sazzle scrum bind. Um, so this is good. but. To build a hash for Scram, you need to have a clear text password. And all of our customers, they're using Salty Chai 512. So how do they migrate to that mechanism? That's a challenge. Um, sorry? Dynamically, as people log in. As people log in, which is a good idea. But now, a user comes in, and the server has to figure out, can I use Scram or can I use Simple Bind? But, or must I use Simple Bind? Because you don't know. So you would need to fetch the data from the, the server, from the directory server, say, can this user use Scram or not? And that creates complexity in your own code about different ways. So one of the things we're doing, we're actually um, implementing a, another mechanism that is proprietary, which is using chef 12 plus Scram. So we can reuse hashed passwords that are with salty chef 12 hash it with Scram, and then move that same algorithm on the client side as well. Um, it's a try. We're going to see um, uh, that. The other option we're going to build is find a way to retrieve what I can do uh, on the client side. So got both options. And I was reading, uh, talking with my architect, and he says, well, maybe we shouldn't build this one. We can have one with PBKDF2 as well. So, so. anyway. Um, this is an interesting problem. When we scale to millions of users, this is an important thing, especially as the biggest threat on password is becoming internal users, not just uh, hackers. <coughs> so to conclude, um, the project is a very active project. It's no longer open source, but we have a pretty big team developing. This diagram on the side is just the I think it's the, the top six contributors in our project on our Git repository for the last two and a half years or something like that. We probably changed more than half of the server code. Um, we've, um, we've actually reduced the number of line of codes by half since we started the project um, 10 years ago. Um, 
So as you've seen this morning, we're working a lot to uh, be cloud native, so run easily in the cloud. Um, and our biggest focus outside that and the small features is really on the one big feature that no one mentions ever when we talk about features is reliability. Um, and then we talk working a lot on efficiency because the machines on which the directory is deployed are getting smaller with less resources. So um, as we're getting more and more efficient, the cost is also reducing. And that's becoming more important for our customers. So thank you. That was it. Question. How, I mean, uh, the Sussel's support is in clients really poor. I mean, not many clients are even supporting a Sussel bind. How do you plan to deal with that? I mean, within yep. the project product family, no problem. Yeah, but um, but with all the LDAP enabled applications you want to integrate, it, that's a, that's an issue. Yeah. So um, so the question is, how can we? Uh, really deploy SASL, CRAM, and DeFi when it's very poor in the, in the libraries. Um, there is no real miracle. We are going to provide support in our own SDK. Uh, we're planning to have a supported release of the SDK coming with the, the release of the product. So our customers can take this and then build application with it. All our servers or our product are going to use it. And this is our main use case for now. Um, other than that, the benefit of Sazzle Scram is you can use both Simple Bind and Sazzle Scram with the same hash and password, which is a secure one. Um, but the cost when you're using Simple Bind is actually about 100 milliseconds, when, whereas if you're doing Sazzle Scram, you back to, like, I think we, we tested to do about 50,000 uh, binds per second with Sazzle Scram. You need a lot of clients, of course. It's no miracle. Any other question? Well, thank you.